Welcome back. My name is Jack Etkin. Uh, welcome to Citizens Forum. My guest in this segment is Victoria Adams, a longtime resident of the city of Victoria. We're going to be talking about the housing crisis. Can I call it that? Mm -hmm. So, Victoria, you said you'd like to talk a bit about the causes of the housing crisis and a book you have called Capital City. Yes. Uh, I feel a uh, housing crisis is not just something we face here in the capital city of Victoria, but in fact throughout the world in our major urban centers. And we're finding that uh, housing is precarious, it's uh, in short supply, and one can say, why did this happen? Why is it such an issue? Uh, at, at our time, has it occurred before in uh, the development of cities? And one can say uh, cities have been transformed through history, but uh, more recently, uh, certainly with the advent of, one could say since the uh, Great Recession in 2007 and 8, um, we've seen the flight of capital and the movement of capital throughout the world. And it basically is unregulated. It can move around to wherever it has the highest return on investment. And we've seen the ravages of capital investment in cities um, to the point that uh, people who reside, work, and live in the cities are finding it um, increasingly more difficult to put a roof over their heads. And whether we're talking about uh, Canada or Vancouver, Toronto, um, or here in Victoria. And uh, certainly it came to my attention more particularly because I'm a renter, have been for most of my life, but I've lived in Canada's major cities. And I find, uh, having spent almost 19 years here, that uh, our city is not escaping from the affordability issues um, that face many, many uh, thousands of residents across our country. So. To my way of thinking, none of this is by accident. This is the plan. The plan has been to create, I think, a shortage of housing because that's what we have. And the shortage of housing has caused not only homelessness, but it's also caused the high prices and, uh, and the high rents. And the shortage of housing is not only a physical shortage of housing, but also allowing speculators from around the world to come in and purchase housing, leave it empty, and make large amounts of money while creating a disaster for the people who actually live here and our governments seem absolutely fine with this. Uh, well they or are. Or am I wrong? No, no. <laughs> they are because they have been the enablers yes. of this crisis. And uh, whether through um, lack of control on the movement of capital around the world, uh, through taxation, through their policies, um, and one can say back here, and, and certainly Canada has one of the highest levels of home ownership in the Western world. So we have also very high debt levels, not surprisingly, where people's investment um, is in their homes. And people today are seeing this as a major asset and perhaps their retirement nest egg. And the government has throughout, certainly over the last uh, 40 to 50 years, has favored home ownership and has actually promoted it, subsidized it, um, whether through capital gains, um, exemptions, through the sale of homes, through uh, taxation, through rebates, through uh, um, basically um, making certain to protect the interests of home ownership. And we can look at it in terms of our financial institutions, the mortgage businesses, the construction industry. They're all tied into um, a very tightly knit and very profitable investment sector. And it's not surprising that we have an unwillingness on the part of the federal government, the provincial government, or even local government to tackle the real issues about where are the privileges and the benefits, where are they going, and where are the burdens, and who bears the greatest costs in this real estate boom that uh, every time we turn around. Um, 
we see fewer and fewer opportunities for young people to find a place to live. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, our, so, our I immigrants. Mean, uh, the federal government and the provincial government mm -hmm. used to be major players in the housing industry. They used to build large numbers of homes. And in my lifetime, we never had a problem like this before. But in the 1990s, the feds yeah. began to get out of building housing and the provinces got out of it as well. So they left it up to the private sector. And I'm sure the private sector realized very quickly that, hey, if we don't build enough homes, if we cause a shortage, then prices are only going to go one way and we're going to make loads and loads of money. I mean, to me, that's what happened. Right. And when it comes back to that enabling uh, position that governments are in, one can say that, that when you have that much capital invested in your country, in your real estate sector, uh, it's not surprising that they are going to do everything possible to preserve those privileges and those uh, investments. And so what we're seeing here, and whether that is speculation um, uh, on the part of Canadians or whether it's from abroad, and I know there's been a whole concern about money laundering in Vancouver and the effects of illegal uh, and certainly the, the whole notion of we have no uh, restraints or even identification of who are the beneficial owners of commercial property in the country or um, large investments. And so we really have to look at uh, where is, who's responsible, what legislation, what political efforts are being made and why this crisis isn't being dealt with. Well, um, what are the why? answers? Right, and, and I think it's safe to say that every time people bring this up, and we see it most frequently in our town meetings, where we see homeowners coming out objecting to um, new condominiums going in at skyrocketing prices that nobody afford, can afford to pay, um, except a very, you know, top 20% or less of the population. and. It's come to the point that cities, in fact, are creating enclaves of capital, the preserves of capital, and in fact, where you have your highest income households moving in, and they have, they've been the beneficiaries of the appreciation of their homes over the years, and they may be cashing yeah. out. But then you have a younger generation today which doesn't have the means that their parents did and doesn't have that length of time. We've got the demographic shift where we have the whole baby boom generation which is going to pass on its uh, wealth accumulation to the next generation. But we can see in the city life the difficulties on the one hand uh, we have so-called progressive electors coming on council but we don't see anything um, primarily changing. There's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of talk about well, if we reduce the size of the units or we streamline our process for approvals or we have more inclusionary housing, that somehow this is going to be the remedy to the housing crisis. But it's not, because it's nothing not. changes. So I, I walk past uh, Saanich City Hall fairly often. Right across the street from Saanich City Hall, there are two malls. They're all one story retail and parking lots. The size of those two malls is about three hectares. And it just strikes me by looking at them, why isn't there housing on, on this three hectares of land? When you look out the front window of Saanich City Hall, that's what you see are these malls. So what's wrong with Saanich City Council? And it's the same in Victoria. If you go from downtown up towards Mayfair Mall, along Government or Douglas or Blanchard, it's all one story huge numbers of parking lots, car dealerships, which are nothing but parking lots, and they tell us there's a housing crisis, which there most certainly is, but there's all this vacant land that remains vacant, not only year after year, but decade after decade, and not one politician will ever do anything about it, except to protect it as, well, as, as it is, which is empty. Part of it may be in, in that regard, but two-thirds, and the city of Victoria is a built-out environment for the, in the main, but two-thirds of our buildable land is actually for homeowner, you know, single-family dwellings. 
So when we look in our city, we actually have 70% of the city of Victoria households rent, which is a very high proportion. You've got cities like Montreal that have 80%. Yeah. And they're getting but killed, the renters are getting killed. Right, and so when we look at the, the housing issues in our city and what's being built, there's a total mismatch between the housing so-called choices we have and in effect the incomes that can sustain that. You know, our median uh, household income in this city is less than 50000 annually. And yet, it certainly costs far more to finance a home today, which is upwards of 800 or 900,000. But if there were more housing, prices would come down. I mean, supply uh, and not demand. Not necessarily, because we, when you look at the amount of people who are uh, coming into the country as newcomers, um, there is a constant demand being uh, created. And on the other hand, there is an attempt on the part of people who live here to either move up and find something appropriate um, or there are young people who are trying to move out of maybe rental accommodation into their own homes to well, raise I a family. Well, I say the solution is for government to come in and just start building housing. It can be very easily done. The land is there, obviously, and the money is there. We're spending $10 billion on Site C. We could solve British Columbia's housing crisis with that amount of money, so why is nothing happening? Uh, housing has become a commodity. It is an investment today, and I give you the example um, I did a study on short-term rentals in the city of Victoria. We have over 1,500. These are vacation rentals, like Airbnb. When you say the city of Victoria, do you mean the greater Victoria? City, no, city of Victoria. Just in the city Just of Victoria? Just in the city of Victoria, we have approximately 1,500 short-term rentals of the Airbnb type. Having said that, if you go on, a, and 86% of them are for entire units. So that means it's either a home or more likely a condo, which is being rented out for the purposes of uh, providing alternative accommodation to tourists in the main, or perhaps longer stay people who might come for uh, a month. And yet, if you go and look at Craigslist to find out how many long-term rentals we have in this city, we have less than 35. We have 1,500 units that are part of our housing stock which are being made available for tourists and yet we have less than 35 in our city for people who need long-term rental accommodation. Now one could say as a homeowner Airbnb says well we're here as your mortgage helper so if you want a way to finance your home if you've got an extra room Maybe you can rent it out to but a tourist. That's not what's happening. It's the whole and place. And unfortunately, yeah. the city has not been forthcoming with its data, and it hasn't revealed the fact that not only have they been unable to properly license these rental units, but it is having an impact on the overall rental accommodation in the sixth in the city. city. For example... No, Victoria, I'm afraid we're out of time. That was the fastest 14 and a half wow. minutes we've ever had. But Wow, okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We just touched the surface, but it is a mess and we've got to fix it up. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.